Well, we're delighted that you're here with us today on this beautiful Friday afternoon in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. In a state like West Virginia, where our geography not only defines us, but frequently confines our residents into inaccessible regions, we need to examine many different ways to deliver quality health care to all of our citizens, no matter where they live in this beautiful state. I'm delighted that you could join us today to hear national experts, including Shepherd's own Board of Governors Chair, Dr. Marsha Brand, who spent much of her career addressing these very issues. They will collectively discuss how we can address the health care access and affordability problem. Dr. Brand has worked closely with several of our deans and directors to put together today's program featuring an esteemed group of experts, including Tom Morris, maybe I can ask you to stand or wave, Tom, <laughs> Alan Morgan, and Amy Elizondo. Thank you. And equally exciting is the news that two new internships involving the National Rural Health Association and the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy have been established. These are paid internships for our students, undergraduate or graduate, or for a student faculty team, and they are made possible through the extraordinary generosity of a special donor committed to the cause, Dr. Marcia Graham. At the end of today's session, Dr. Ben Martz and Dr. Sharon Maley will describe the internship process and how to apply. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Marcia Graham. Marsha was one of the very first people I had the honor and pleasure of meeting during the presidential interview <coughs> process in her role as chair of the Presidential Selection Committee. Since our initial meeting, she has served as a steady and wise source of advice and counsel during my very first year as president at Shepherd University. She approaches issues and problems in a methodical and calm manner. And as a scientist, I greatly admire those qualities. Dr. Brand serves as a senior advisor to the DentaQuest Foundation and the executive director of the National Interprofessional Initiative on Oral Health. She has held a number of highly distinguished national leadership positions in the federal government and in academic health care, and currently serves as a consultant and advisor on matters related to access to oral health and rural health care. From 2009 to 2015, Dr. Brand was a Deputy Administrator of the Health Resources and Services Administration. This is an agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that works to fill the gaps for people who live outside the economic and medical mainstream. The agency uses its $10 billion annual budget and its staff of over 1,800 individuals to expand access to quality health care in partnership with health care providers and training programs. From 2001 to 2009, Dr. Brand served as the Health Services Resources Administration and is both Director of the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and of the Bureau of Health Professions. In previous federal appointments, she led efforts to plan and implement the state planning grant program and coordinated the agency's efforts to implement the Children's Health Insurance Program. During her career, she was the recipient of the Presidential Merit Rank Award for Distinguished <coughs> Service in 2011, and she received the Phillips Award for Public Service in 2015. Her alma mater, Old Dominion University, honored her with an Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters in 2015, and she delivered the commencement address to the Batten College of Engineering and Technology, the College of Health Sciences, and the College of Sciences. In that address, Dr. Brand stressed the importance of mentors and of being a trusted, respectful, and supportive colleague. Dr. Brand has spent a successful career living up to those very high standards. Dr. Brand will give us an overview of rural health 
policy today, and I thank her very much for putting together this very special forum for all of us. Thank you. Goodness, Dr. Hendricks. <laughs> Very, very um, generous. I really appreciate um, those remarks. Despite all those things that Marsha Brand can do, she's not particularly good at technology or education, so she wants to make sure that everything is going in the right direction. Um, thank you so much for being here today. It is truly my pleasure to meet with you, and I am so pleased that my colleagues from World Health are here. These are the uh, folks who are most influential in the nation. Uh, in improving the access to rural health care in our, uh, excuse me, rural health care in our communities. And so, Tom and Alan and Amy, it's um, so thrilled that you could be here today. I'm going to just um, share with you a little information to set this afternoon up. I'm going to talk about what's rural, uh, rural versus urban, <coughs> how they're different, and what does this mean in terms of health, why we need rural health policy, and a little bit about my personal interest in creating rural health internships. Rural uh, is a fairly inexact term. term. It means very different things to different people, and depending on whose definition you are using, there are somewhere between 46 and 52 million rural people in this nation. Um, there are a number of uh, different definitions of rural that have been created over the years, and these are the three that are most commonly and commonly used: the U.S. Census Bureau definition the Office of Management and Budget Definition, and the definition from the Economic Research Service from the USDA. So why do we need these definitions and how do we use them? They're really important to the government in particular for determining how we're going to make policy, regulations, and administer our programs. There is generally not one definition that suits all needs, and specifically an agency may select the definition that best meets their requirements. And so if I'm making federal grants, what's the best definition for that grant program? If I'm implementing programs and laws, what are the best definitions for those activities? If I want to do research and learn more about rural communities, what definition should we choose so that we're all consistent in, in measuring rural in the same way? And then just to complicate things a bit further, there's a definition for frontier, which basically defines areas of even more sparsely population and isolated. And so rural and urban areas, how do they differ besides these definitions? And certainly what immediately comes to mind are the occupations that we engage in. Uh, roughly 9% of the nation's population, rural population, is engaged in agriculture. Uh, many of us here in West Virginia are engaged in the extraction industries, coal, gas, and lumber. Somewhere around 12% um, of jobs in rural community are manufacturing jobs. Uh, however, the largest employer in many communities are the hospital and school systems, employing about 22% of rural people. Our cultures are different. Um, I suspect that, uh, that uh, the further you get and closer you get to the city, the less likely you are to have participated in 4-H or Rotary. Um, our religious institutions are particularly important to have county fairs that um, the neighbors across the street, street go cat, cattle for all summer long so that they're ready. Um, travel times are really important and uh, transportation is important too. Many families have one car, uh, often defined as the beater. Um, that car needs to be running for folks to get to work, to school, to church. Our socioeconomic status may be different. It's somewhat regionally um, dependent. The, our initial view is often to think that folks in rural communities um, don't do as well financially as urban communities. There are some places where that is true. Uh, but in New England, for example, rural and urban communities have similar household incomes. It certainly impacts our health insurance status because a number of the jobs that we're talking about are less likely to provide insurance. Broadband is a very important issue in rural America. Um, and certainly uh, pride, family, tradition, and independence are important in our rural communities. Uh, urban versus rural even impacts our hotel amenities. If you look at the <coughs> picture on your left, this is the closet in a hotel in Boston, which is where the foundation is located. You open the door, you find, in addition to the iron, the two matching zebra-printed <coughs> bathrooms and the yoga mat. The picture on the right 
is from Fairview, Oklahoma, which is where my husband is from. And if you look in the restroom or the bathroom there, you see this basket full of washcloths that's, and it says, if you can't see it, please use our laundered yet stained washcloths for any messy job, including makeup, red dirt, mud, boots and tools, etc. Thank you, the management. <laughs> so urban versus rural certainly has a significant impact on our lives. But the other thing, the other point I want to make too is that rural is not rural. You can be New England progressive rural. You can be Midwestern nice rural. You can be Southeastern rural. And what I mean there is something uh, the culture is quite different. For example, in the Southeast, you can say anything about anyone if you follow it with bless his heart. <laughs> so you can say, Alan, you are such an ass. Bless your heart. <laughs> and it always excused. We know in Appalachia, the culture that we have is very different from the Delta. And how many of you have been to Alaska? If you run the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy for any period of time, it is requisite that you go there. I have been there eight times in my tenure. And there's something about Alaska that makes you pretty sure that folks got as far as they could get before the money ran out. You know? <laughs> and so there's a certain rugged uh, culture there. So how does rurality impact health? We know that your access to primary and specialty care is determined by where you live that we live in communities where you may not be able to access good food, uh, that taking a walk is a dangerous thing to do along the side of the road. Uh, so we may be in environments that don't promote, promote healthy lifestyles. There may be variations <coughs> in health literacy, and as I said before, health insurance status, because small business and ag jobs don't typically provide insurance. And sometimes, but not always, our health outcomes are poor for our rural populations. So to address this, rural health policy sort of evolved through the 1980s. And it was a way to do research, programmatic activity, and regulatory activity to try to address rural communities' challenges. And so how do we make sure that rural communities have affordable health care? How, how do we frame, how do we make Medicare and Medicaid work for our rural communities? How do we keep ourselves from shooting ourselves in our rural foot when we change Medicare policy? That's, that's Tom's job. Um, how do we attract health care providers who want to live <coughs> and practice in those communities? And so this, is, this taken together is the principles or the plans that, that um, help our government address these challenges. And this takes place at the federal, state, and local level. And there are many organizations and individuals engaged in rural health policy. So, our lawmakers, and that would be those would be the folks in Washington D.C., the congressional folks, the states, um, the government agencies, and Tom will talk a little bit about that specifically. Member organizations, and Alan and Amy will speak to what they do at the National Health Association. Researchers, providers, patients, citizens—they all have a role to improve in improving uh, our rural health outcomes. And so, why do I care? Um, from 2001 to 2008, I was the director of the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. It was the best job I ever had. And if Tom wasn't doing such a bang up job at it now, I might make another run at it. <laughs> um, uh, it was incredibly rewarding because the people who were engaged in rural health were advocates for the people that they knew and cared about, and it was personal for them. It was not uncommon to go to a, a conference and hear someone say, um, one of the greatest challenges in our community is access to behavioral health services. In our community, the jails are the waiting rooms for behavioral health. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, people really care. You know, when you went to a conference, the first person, uh, you've all been to a conference, and the first person who gets to the mic, you know, usually wants to cite his or her own literature so you know how smart they are, you know? That's not what happens at a rural health conference. The first person to the mic is impassioned about helping the people in the communities in which they live. It's, it's personal for them. And it's personal for me. If you are easily offended, I would suggest that you turn your eyes away. Okay, everybody who's easily offended has turned his or her eyes away. I'm from West Virginia. Stage shaped like this. <laughs> My folks are from here, from Preston County, outside of Morgantown. 
They were farmers and miners and school teachers. They were from Appalachia. Uh, it matters to me that we address the challenges in rural health in this country. And as a member of the Board of Governors, um, and it is a privilege to have this position and certainly to work alongside Dr. Hendricks, who's been an extraordinary addition to, to our university. You know, I wanted to contribute something to the university that really mattered to me and might be new and different and might make create opportunities for others. And so I kept thinking about what can I do, what can I do that's <coughs> different. And what I want to do is create a pipeline for folks who want to be engaged in rural health. And to do that, they need to have a really exciting learning experience. And so I have um, volunteered and, and I'm excited about providing two internships a year for 10 years. That's 20 years. I plan to be here when this is finished <laughs> to make sure that there are 20 people who are prepared to be advocates um, on behalf of rural people. And the, the challenge, too, is where do you get that skill set? Because it's not something that you can necessarily get in a classroom um, or even a, a, a practice environment. Um, you can get it at the Federal Office of Rural Policy, and you can get it at the National Health Association. Uh, ORHP is in Rockville, and RHA is in DC. And so I'm hopeful that from this uh, funding opportunity, through this funding opportunity, we'll have students from nursing uh, and business administration who are engaged in health, social work, and perhaps others who want to do this work. And so we've been working on the selection process, and Dr. Smart and Martin, uh, Dr. Maley will tell us more about that. Um, and the other thing I would like to leave you with today is a bit of a challenge. You know, I'm making a 10-year commitment for two interns, um, but there are others in the community who might make a similar commitment to support internships in another area because they want to support the university. They have a policy area, um, and something in the arts, the sciences, or business that they're really exceptionally passionate about, and they want to support our existing programs. And so I would encourage you to consider this as an opportunity um, if you want to give to this university. And I want to make sure I give uh, credit to the folks who helped me pull this together. Um, it is now my uh, privilege to introduce to you um, briefly the, the folks who are going to be on our program this afternoon. Um, first is Tom Mars, who is the Associate Administrator for the uh, Health, Rural Health Policy um, Office in the U.S. federal government. He oversees $146 million worth of resources that go out to rural communities. Um, he tries to ensure that the way we implement Medicare and Medicaid supports our rural communities, too. You have their bio sketches. I would just add to this, this that, that um, Tom was an intern a couple times himself and knows this world. He also run, uh, won the Presidential Merit Rank Award. Um, and he's a Taurus, so his birthday's coming up soon. <laughs> um, Alan Morgan. Uh, is the uh, CEO of the National Rural Health Association. And if you've ever had a chance to engage the NRHA, um, you would know that their slogan is, your voice louder. And if you've ever talked to Alan for very long, <laughs> you'll see why that might be their slogan. Um, he has been in, uh, spent 22 years in health policy. He's worked on the Hill. Um, and he has been uh, identified by the readers of uh, modern healthcare medicine <coughs> as among the top 100 most influential people in healthcare. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Amy Alessandro. She's the Vice President of Program Services for the National World Health Association. Uh, she's, uh, before she was at NRHA, she worked at CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services. She also did a fellowship at HRSA. Um, and she is an extraordinary individual, and I'm so proud to have the opportunity to work here. You also need to know that she learned to cut down a tree on Scott and Alan's farm <laughs> some years back. So she has a she has a history in our community. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom. Tom? Before I get started, uh, Marcia's right. I did start out as an intern. Um, I'm just blown away by what you're doing here, and uh, that you've made such a commitment to do this for future students. And uh, I'd like to consider myself a, a mentee of yours. Um, I think that the 16 years I worked with Marsha were uh, among the best years of, of my professional life. And I'm still learning from Marsha. And so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. 
uh, to be part of this event. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all um, about some of these issues. So a little, I want to provide a little bit of a federal perspective on rural health. I'll build on some of the uh, issues that Marsha brought up. But I think the first thing I'm going to start out with is a little bit of myth busting. And, and I think Marsha sort of uh, hit on this. And the fact is, I think sometimes when we think about national policy, we think about one size fits all. And because that's the easier thing to do, and the majority of the folks in this country live in urban areas, and the policies, you know, are sort of geared towards them. So what I think we really need to start with is, rural is not a smaller version of, of urban, and uh, so you can't take urban solutions and just downsize them a little bit and have them work in rural. And there's a bit of a, a thematic going on here. You know, I always think of the New Yorker uh, cartoon, and you see Chicago and New York and Los Angeles, and the rest is all flyover country. And sometimes I think we have a tendency to fall into that trap uh, in our policy making. And you know, we constantly, you know, that old analogy, the square peg and the round hole, um, I think applies to it. In fact, you know, that could have been the name for our office, um, <laughs> the, the office of square pegs, but we came up with something better. Um, but Marsha talked about some of these issues. There are key differences. And if you don't take these issues into account in policy making and how you think about things, um, it can be a real challenge. So I won't repeat what she said, but a couple I wanted to add to. So in, in rural communities, you're more likely to have primary care providers. You're not going to have as many specialists. Uh, and, uh, access to behavioral health is less, oral health is less. Um, so you have to take that into account. You can't just get a referral to a cardiologist or a dermatologist and have that person be just down the road. You know, those, those folks are often located in urban areas. Um, and, we, and the other dominating part of the clinician landscape is it's defined by shortages. Um, many parts of this country have a shortage of one of, of those providers I've mentioned. Uh, higher poverty in rural areas. Marsha mentioned the geographic isolation. Um, the other part is the payer mix. If you think about um, in an urban area, the dominant payer is going to be your private insurance, and, and that tends to be a, a, a good payer for most healthcare providers. Medicare and Medicaid often make up 50, 60, 70 percent of a small hospital or a small rural clinic's payer base. And so when we make a change at the federal level between Medicare or Medicaid, it has far more implications for those providers than it would for an urban provider. They're almost flipped in a lot of ways. And so if we don't take that into account when we're designing policy, uh, things happen that, that end up working to the detriment of rural communities. So that pair mix, I think, is really important. The other uh, defining characteristic I mentioned is low patient volumes. Um, you know, any, anything you, you do in rural, you're talking about fewer patients, fewer providers. So if we're designing a payment system that's built on, say, a system of averages, that's not going to work as well in rural as it will in urban areas. And so that needs to be taken into account. And we're also seeing a declining population in rural communities. Um, overall, nationally, for the last 30 years, we've seen more and more population loss out of rural. It's not true everywhere. There are some areas that are actually gaining. But by and large, um, what you see is, is, is more uh, loss of population than gain. So we talked about definitions of rural, and there certainly are plenty of them. That's usually the first question we get whenever we talk about rural health. This is the definition that we use in my office. And then we base it based on, are you in a non-metro county? All because counties are not uniform sizes, we'll also take into account if you're in a really big county, are there rural pockets within that at the census tract level? And so that's sort of a hybrid definition. And you can see, I think this is a microcosm. You look at this map for the challenge of rural policy. Look at the size of counties in the east and then take your eye west. And so you have a county like San Bernardino County in California, which has Death Valley in it. That's an urban county, because the tip of the Los Angeles area is on the far western side of it. And it pulls Death Valley into a, what they consider a metro area. And so you know, this is the challenge we have. How do you design policy that's going to work as well in a state like Georgia with like 120 counties as you do in a state like Nevada or, or California? Um, you know, we have to be really careful about which building blocks we use, how we think about resources, and how they're allocated. But for our definition, we're roughly talking about 70% of the population spread across about 80% of the land mass of the country. So thinking about the clinician workforce, uh, across the board, we have fewer docs per 10,000 folks in uh, metro areas than we do in metro. It's also true if you add in nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Uh, it's really dramatic when you get into uh, professions like dentists and dental hygienists. But perhaps the area that I think is, 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 is really where we face some challenges is in the area of mental health. And I would draw your eye to the far right of this slide. And these are counties without any mental health provider. And as you go down from the top to the bottom, 
you can see the majority of the counties that have no mental health service provider are in rural America. And that's a real challenge. Uh, and you think about laying that on top of issues like the opioid crisis we're having right now. <coughs> and if you don't have those resources, you know, the clinicians out there, you know, what sort of hope do we have to really make sure we get people in the treatment that they need? And so again, these are the sort of issues we wrestle with all the time. What I want to do is also give you a sense of the infrastructure that's out there. Um, we hear the term safety net a lot. And the safety net typically makes up those folks who take care of folks who maybe don't have access to insurance or, or you know, struggle to get access to care generally. Um, when I think about the safety net, I think about three main providers. Uh, first is critical access hospitals. These are uh, hospitals that are 25 beds or less. Typically, they're about 35 miles from another hospital. Um, these are mostly outpatient focused but, uh, with an emergency room. Um, and they're the anchors for healthcare in their community. There's about 1,300 plus of these spread across the country. But as you can see, they're heavily in the middle <coughs> of the country, especially as you get into the Midwest and the upper Great Plains. Uh, but they play an incredibly important role. Can you imagine how hard it is to recruit a doc if you don't have a hospital? How hard it is to get a home health agency, all the associated providers. The hospital, no matter how small it is, is often the locus for care in these communities. And we've struggled, I'd say, for 30 years to figure out what's the right way under Medicare to pay these folks. Because they're low volume, they're small, and yet, in many ways, they have to meet the same regulations that a hospital in Baltimore, like Johns Hopkins, has to meet. And we keep trying again. That square peg round hole issue keeps coming up time and time again. The other key provider is uh, the community health centers. These are run out of my agency, the Health Resources and Services Administration. And these are the, the, the providers who see folks regardless of their ability to pay. And they've really expanded greatly in the last 10 to 15 years. And they really are the backbone of the safety net. But you can see they're not quite in the same areas as the critical access hospitals. You see much more of an eastern influence there, and also along the west coast. I'll add one more on top of that, and that are rural health clinics. This is a payment designation under Medicare. Um, this designation, a nurse practitioner can own the clinic, or a physician assistant. It could be a standalone clinic, or it could be part of a hospital. Um, and these are the folks are often in areas where there are no other providers. So you can see that they look a little bit differently than the previous two maps. So I'll go through them again. Here's where the hospitals are. There's where the FQHCs are, and here's where the RACs. Some overlap, but also some differences. But the three of them together really are the backbone of that safety net for, for rural health care delivery. Other areas where it's a little challenging in rural areas, not on EMS, emergency medical services. Um, we have very little data on this. Most of rural communities rely on a mix of volunteer uh, agencies. Uh, keeping folks up in terms of their training can be challenging. Still in this day and age, we don't have 911 coverage across this country. Most areas, yes, but not everywhere. Um, they face the same dilemma I was just talking about. You talk about an ambulance that's covering a huge county. And anytime you send an ambulance out on a run, that's one other run they can't go on for somebody else. So you've got low volume, you've got really high fixed costs, and they get paid the same per trip by Medicare or Medicaid as if they were in Washington, D.C., by and large. And so, consequently, they're not really that financially uh, viable. And that is a real impact on rural communities also. Public health looks different in every state and every community in this country. Uh, some states are, uh, have their health department centralized with the state government. Some folks have a county-based presence. But what we know by and large for local health departments is they're much more reliant on financing from the government, from the federal government, uh, than they are from their local government. And so again, they face some real challenges in providing the full range of services that you would be providing if you were in a metro area uh, health department. And so as we think about how we're going to affect health outcomes and, and the health status for folks, if we, if we design policy <coughs> based on the, the thought that it's going to work as well in metro national Tennessee as it will in a small town in Wyoming, we're not dealing with the same infrastructure. Uh, the other real challenge we have are long-standing health disparities. There's higher rates of chronic disease. Uh, higher rates of suicide, smoking, we mentioned poverty before, lower educational attainment, these are things like the social determinants of health that have a real impact on how people approach their own health care delivery. And as I mentioned with the opioids, we now have higher rates of substance abuse in many parts of rural America. And it's not just opioids, so it's across the board, especially with alcohol. And um, so all these things, it, would not surprise, it should not surprise anybody in the room that there's a toll to all of this. 
And what we see emerging in the last 10 to 15 years is a growing gap between rural and urban areas in terms of life expectancy. Um, and and the, the, the lines are going in the wrong direction right now. And there's been a lot of attention to this in the past year. Interesting, uh, there were some Princeton researchers, Deaton and Case, that did a big thing about the white working class and some of their issues. For some reason, they chose not to cut their data rural and urban. Uh, we had researchers who did. So while that got all the public attention, we were focusing on this from a more geographic standpoint. And I think it's even more dramatic from a geography standpoint than it is uh, from a national perspective. And so what you can read about in the popular mainstream media, think about that through a rural lens. And you see you really have some challenges. And Alan's going to touch a little bit more on this because I think it's been a galvanizing issue for him. It, it also has been for my office because to me, when you talk about things like a higher mortality rate, lower life expectancy, it allows you to talk about all the issues we're dealing with in rural health, lack of workforce, huge health disparities, uh, you know, geographic isolation, all those things manifest themselves in when you die and how long you live. And so it has offered us a, an opportunity, I think, to talk about this and to get engaged in a public policy debate that takes this into account. What it really results in, though, is that we're finding from some new CDC data is that each year, thousands more rural residents die uh, uh, a potentially excess death compared to their urban, uh, uh, urban folks. And that's true across the disease states, you know, whether it's heart disease, cancer, uh, respiratory disease. Um, this is a metric that can be turned around, um, but right now uh, creates a real concern. And so the fact that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control within HHS, they've really been focusing on this of late. It's starting to get more attention, and, um, and that uh, you know, addressing a challenge, the first thing you got to do is acknowledge it. And I feel like we're acknowledging it now. And now the question from a public policy standpoint is what are we going to do about it? Similarly with the opioid crisis, another issue we're tracking. We know that in, in rural areas, the drug-related deaths are higher. Um, we know it's quite variable from state to state. Certainly West Virginia has been a state that's been hit as hard as anybody by this. And so there's new funding that's been available from the Congress. It's going to go out through the states through a block grant. But again, that creates a public policy challenge in itself. We have a tendency of block grant money in the states, but the notion that a state is better suited to make decisions about where to allocate money than perhaps folks in Washington, that's largely true. But we have to make sure that as that money gets allocated, it goes to the areas of greatest need. And sometimes there's a tendency to think about, well, should we put the money where we can move the dial, where we can change that, um, or should we put it where it's the greatest need, even if we're not affecting the most people? I don't have the answer to that question, but I wanted to frame it for you because it's a typical of the sort of debates and uh, discussions we have in our office, and I think it's typical of the sort of things that we bring an intern in to those discussions with. So a little bit about how the federal government plays a role in rural health care, and I shouldn't say that we're the only role. It's really a partnership, federal, state, and local. Um, but historically, the federal government has played a role in supporting rural health care. We do it through workforce training grants. Uh, in the bureau that Marcia used to run in HRSA. Um, we have a program that places uh, uh, doctors and nurses and uh, uh, psychologists uh, in rural areas and urban underserved areas. That's the National Service Corps. Um, there's infrastructure support. The federal government puts out a lot of capital money to build facilities through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, the other way that the uh, federal government is involved in thinking about how to target dollars is where is the area of greatest need? And the way we do that in, in, in my agency is we define what the shortage areas are. We call them either health profession shortage areas or medically underserved areas. Um, what we're doing is trying to figure out what's the best way to know where the folks are that need these services the most. And we do that by designating these areas. I mentioned the challenge we have with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, what we've done over the years is try to figure out if there's a way to pay rural hospitals, rural physicians, a little bit differently that gives them a better chance to be economically viable. Because if you can't make money as a clinician, you're not going to go to that community. And that means you're not going to have access, and you know, you know what that will bring about. So since about late 1980s, early 1990s, Medicare started experimenting with different ways to pay hospitals, different ways to pay physicians. And I think we're still trying to figure out if we've got that right. We had hospitals in rural communities closing in the 1980s. It stabilized in the late 90s and early 2000s. Alan will talk a little bit about the fact that that's creeping up once again. We've had a number of closures since 2010. So I feel like we're at another tipping point where we're going to have to figure out 
given what we know about rural communities, what's the best way to pay for these services in hospitals? So one of the ways that we try to inform that is by doing payments and demonstrations. For instance, we're getting ready to start a demonstration, I'm talking about HHS, starting a demonstration in Pennsylvania that's going to look at a global payment for a hospital. So five or six of their rural hospitals would get a lump sum at the beginning of the year to cover all the services they want, and then they'd be able to configure how they want to do that without us telling them exactly what that should look like. I think that's a promising experiment, so we'll see what happens over the coming years. But every advance we've had that has worked well for rural communities in my career has come about because we've tested it out in either a pilot or a demonstration. So again, these are the sort of meetings we're in all the time. The students from Shepherd will be able to be part of those meetings and learn from that discussion. Marsha uh, talked about you know, the provision of insurance. Certainly looks different in rural areas. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, as I mentioned, are, are a dominant form of insurance coverage in rural areas. So is the Children's Health Insurance Program. And now we've got the marketplace plans out there. And we know that market is still stabilizing. Uh, but we knew heading into the ACA that more rural America is going to be eligible for support under the um, expanded coverage than, than their urban counterparts. So that's the role the federal government can play, either in subsidizing public <coughs> coverage or in providing direct public coverage. Uh, another important role for, for HHS and for some of our federal partners is investing in technology. We invest a lot in telemedicine, which allows you to link a rural clinic to an urban hospital and maybe provide a service like mental health that isn't available locally. Uh, now, we're not the sole ones doing this. Sometimes states are very innovative in this, and we, we send a lot of our money through the states to do this in partnership. And so, I think understanding the whole role of federalism, how the feds and the states work together is important. The other thing we do is we work a lot with foundations. So again, your students will have a chance, I think, to see what it's like to do public-private partnerships. So in a lot of ways, um, you know, all of that factors into how we approach our job at the Federal Office of Rural Policy. Uh, Marsh and I had the benefit of working for a wonderful man, a director named Wayne Myers, and he used to call us the Office of Unintended Consequences. <laughs> and uh, I've stolen that line many times. But it really is. We're there for when it doesn't work. And then how can we help you think about it on the back end? We're also there to help you think about it on the front end. And so we're working <coughs> in, in the Health Resources and Services Administration in HRSA, but we have a department-wide charge across all of HHS to help people think about whether they're doing a grant program or how a Medicare payment formula works. We're there to do that. And we also operate a range of grant programs uh, that either allows communities or the states uh, for really capacity building, in essence. And so um, a little bit about the, the long scope of, of the work we've been doing. You know, it's rural health policy really kind of came of age in the late 80s uh, when this first wave of hospital closures happened. And this is a very busy slide. And I don't, you know, even a health policy one would want you all the way through it, so I won't burden you all either. But what I want to, the point I want to make for you is that I want to get, throughout this tenure, um, there are new issues that come up, but the same fundamental challenges. Patient volume, um, urban-based solutions that don't tend to work so well in rural. So whatever legislation Congress passes, there's always usually a period of adjustment. And it's, it's the thing that we're there to do every step of the way. And so for the opportunity uh, to help groom some future leaders, that's a great thing for us. I came in as an intern, Amy came in as an intern, and you know it's a very complicated history, but if we can get people interested in it early, I think we have a chance to continue the progress we've made over the years. I don't think that the, the challenges are going away, um, but we do need to make sure that we're thinking about them as new opportunities come forward. We do a lot of that through our policy work. We review all the regulations that come through uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. So, you know, even as an intern, uh, you know, I had Medicare regulations to read. I may not have known what I was looking at, but I had the regulation to read. But, the, chance, the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that you'll, they'll have an opportunity to get exposed to that. So we do this uh, regulatory review. We also fund a fair amount of health services research. So we'll be reviewing research papers. It's hard to do any sort of policy work if you don't have data and research to back you up. And that's a big part of what our office does. We, I also mentioned the grant programs we have. Um, and so we see an opportunity uh, for interns to get involved in helping us think about how we might want to shape the design of our grant programs. For instance, in our community-based division, uh, we have a wonderful uh, flexible grant authority uh, called the Rural Health Outreach Authority. And it allows us to put money out there for the community to decide how they want to use that funding. Typically, 
you know, the way we allocate funding federally is we sort of define the area we want to invest in and then the community responds. This is one of the only programs I'm aware of where the community tells us what they want to do. And then if they can write a credible grant and make a, a good effort toward that, we'll fund that project. And so um, we have the opportunity, I think, to learn a lot from those communities across a broad range of issues. In our hospital state division, we work a lot with small rural hospitals around quality improvement and performance improvement because they're so small, these facilities, that new reporting requirements around quality can sometimes overwhelm uh, the staff. Typically, nobody wears one hat at a rural hospital. Uh, the director of nursing is also the director of quality. Um, and so what we try to do is provide some grant funding to help them along the way on that. Um, and then on the finance side, it's just always a challenge to keep up with the complexities of building whether that's for private plans or Medicare or Medicaid. And so um, it's important for us to support these hospitals in that area. We do that uh, through a network of state offices of rural health. Each state has a state office of rural health, and that's where our grant dollars go. So we really do work in partnership with them to work very closely with small rural hospitals. And then we also invest in telehealth. Uh, we have a telehealth network grant program, and each year we, we put out grant funds for this, and we're trying to figure out how to do two things. We know that using this technology can improve access to care. You can get a service into a rural community that somebody would otherwise have to drive 30, 40 minutes, maybe even an hour. So we've been doing this for 10, 15 years. We know it improved access. What we know less about is what the impact of that access is. Uh, so how does a service compare if you get it via telehealth compared to if you got it face to face? And so what we're trying to do with our grant program is figure out how we can answer both of those questions. And we funded a research center specifically looking at telehealth. And so again, an opportunity for somebody to come in as an intern and learn a little bit about all of this. And um, we're a small enough shop, we have about 50 folks in my office, um, that it's not hard to pull somebody into a meeting and let them be part of that thought process. And so we see an opportunity across all of this work uh, for our interns. Um, so again, policy analysis, regulatory review, all those things are going to be opportunities for those students. I know, um, you know, I came to Washington to be an intern and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, I thought I'd come up, work for a couple months and go back to North Carolina. It's been 22 years, I haven't come back to North Carolina. I was lucky enough to be there at the right time, and, but had I not had an internship, I don't know what I'd be doing. And it really was a wonderful opportunity. And it was a small enough office, and um, because rural health affects everything, um, you know, you get exposure to so many different issues. There are wonderful places to do an internship, at like NIH, where you might go to the National Cancer Institute, but you're only going to do cancer. With us, whether you like it or not, you're going to do everything. We're an inch deep and a mile wide. And for me, it worked great as an intern. I think for me, it worked equally well. So we're excited about this opportunity. Um, really just credit Marsha for coming up with the idea. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to hosting an intern, especially because, as you may have read, we're a hiring freeze. So anytime <laughs> get some help, we'd love to do that. Um, so anyway, I'll close with that and just really thank Marsha for the opportunity and, and thank you all for uh, the opportunity to be here and talk to you. Good afternoon. <laughs> As you may have heard, I'm the loud one on the program. Dr. Rand alluded to that. That actually is a misnomer. I am more, I don't think I'm loud. I think I'm enthusiastic, I'm passionate about rule, and I'm highly caffeinated, which is a volatile <laughs> mix for a Friday afternoon, is it not? Yes. Um, I, what an amazing legacy that Dr. Rand is establishing, establishing internships in rural health care at the Federal Office of Rural Health or at the National Rural Health Association. If you are a student that cares about rural, if you know a student that cares about rural, just think about that opportunity, will you? After their internship is over and they meet with their peers and they say, what'd you do for the summer? The response is, eh, the usual, improve the lives of 62 million Americans. <laughs> What an amazing testament and legacy that you're leaving. So thank you so much, Marsha. Really, really appreciate that. You may have caught, did you catch, I said 62 million Americans, which is a different number than what you heard earlier from the earlier two speakers. We're all rural at heart, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about rural health, about rural health policy, and where we're going 
as a country. So far you've heard from uh, a longtime advocate, Dr. Rand, you've heard from the federal government about their perspective on it. At NRHA, we are the passionate voice. We are the advocate on behalf of rural communities. So I'm going to um, touch on many of the same data they've covered, but the really neat part about it is how do you tell the story? So what I want to do is convey it in a manner in which that not only you care, um, that policymakers care too. They see the relevance. Why do we need to support and enhance rural America as we go ahead? We have more than 22,000 members across the U.S. This is a map of where our membership is located at. Can everyone see your dot? <laughs> now in West Virginia, you understand it. This, this makes sense to you. Um, I always like the western part of the U.S. because most people think, wait a second, that is rural America. Where are your members, right? Well, if you've been following the national news lately, you will realize that three-fourths of that land out there is federally owned. People don't live there. And so, naturally, we don't have members out there. The other third of that land, of course, as you all know, is owned by Ted Turner. And so, <laughs> for the students, that's a joke, but for the rest of you, you understand that. As a child, I was promised how health care was going to be when I grew up. The Jetsons told us how it would be, right? Yep. Growing up in Northeast Kansas, I knew that my doctor would be on my TV screen, and I couldn't believe it would cost me $100. Now I would love that price point for my health care. But that is not what we have, is it? No. Instead, this is what we see in many parts of rural America. This is actually a photo I took last fall from Netawaka, Kansas. It's only about 15 miles from my hometown of Holton. This is what we have in many areas of rural. Now, let's talk about rural and what is rural. What we're trying to do is change that last picture that you saw of Netawaka and move it towards that Jetson's realization of how we should be realizing healthcare. This map actually shows that effort underway. As we try to redesign the healthcare system, we change, as Tom said, the payment methodology. We're trying to promote clinicians to keep people healthy and out of the hospital in the first place, right? How do we keep rural populations healthy? Now that's not the cool part about this map. I saw this map and I said, this map is wrong. This map shows metropolitan areas across the U.S. listed, as you see in the gold, and rural areas that have these new payment design models in the light turquoise blue. I said, your map is wrong. It has um, Netawaka, Kansas listed as a metropolitan area. They checked with the federal government. No, this map is accurate. According to the federal government, this is metropolitan USA. <laughs> I don't know about you, but Dr. King really needs to wash the mud off of his sign <laughs> if he's going to per compete with clinicians from downtown New York City. So the point being is um, you have to designate rural areas, but defining rural America oftentimes can make you look somewhat foolish, so we have to be careful with that. At NRHA, we keep a simple definition. Rural America is the place where those most in need of health care services have the fewest options available. Again, it's a place where health disparities, high health disparities, meet face-to-face -face with workforce shortage. That is what is unique, unfortunately, about rural America. Once you understand this dynamic, health policy is a piece of cake to understand. Now, solving it is a little bit more difficult. So what I want to do is highlight some of the issues that you've heard so far and put a, a context on these issues. First, let's start with the disparities. Um, as Tom mentioned, over the last year, the national media has focused in on this discrepancy between rural Americans and urban Americans when it comes to life expectancy. This is a simplified version of the chart that Tom shared with you. Um, what I did is I took off, Tom's chart had male, female, urban, rural, I took off the genders because I just wanted 
to see what's the metro non-metro. This is really good stuff for two reasons. One, this clearly shows you that something happened in 1990. In about 1992, where rural and urban were trending upward together, it diverged. Something in the 90s happened where life expectancy from rural populations began to decline. But what I like about this map is, um, okay, so it's declining, it's <coughs> going up, right? At least they're both going up. Ah, no, 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 no. This is metro, non-metro, not rural, urban. So what this map actually does is this is combining flush Kansas in with Alexandria, Virginia. This is combining rural areas in with the suburbs of major metropolitan areas where we've seen some of the greatest increases in life expectancy. So this is masking how bad it actually is in rural America. For that, you have to take a different look. And I look at the Robert Wood Johnson data where they actually show that over the same period as nationally we've seen great ex uh, extension of life expectancy, in rural America, life expectancy is declining. Now just think about that. Is that even remotely accurate? Is it fair? Is it moral that your geography will dictate your life expectancy? In some areas, as much as 20 years. Just amazing, amazing. When you talk about health policy, we have to figure out what's driving this, how can we stop it, and how can we reverse these trends? Now, when I talk to the media about that, they, they, they really want to know the obvious question. Why? What's driving this, right? Well, Tom touched on, I'm going to touch on a couple big issues, but before I do, this life expectancy, let's be honest, this is a proxy for quality of life, right? It doesn't mean that, oh, I'm living um, in the rural area, then I'm only going to live to 52, but it does indicate what might happen to you from a quality standpoint during your lifetime. Well, obviously, let's look at two big drivers. Number one, um, you've all heard about the opioid crisis. Um, this is a rural crisis. When you look at the numbers, it is a rural crisis. It needs a rural solution. The data and the numbers are driving those deaths. Another measure, suicide rates. Um, this is kind of a complicated graph, but as you go further away from urban, the suicide rates increase. So. Opioids, suicides, both numbers that dramatically show why people are dying younger in a rural context. What do these two things have in common? Well, both of them have a rural behavioral aspect. <coughs> and when you're looking at the disparity between providers in rural America and urban America, when you look at behavioral uh, health, you see the greatest deficiency when you look at access to care. So. If, at the National Rural Health Association, we don't represent just providers, we represent communities. But if you're going to improve health care, you really have to realize that access to care drives quality of care and your life expectancy both. You have to deal with both of those issues. Having a clinician there is important. Great, we know that, right? So as a country, we can easily address that. And we're doing it. No, we are going the exact opposite way. This is from uh, a week and a half ago. Front page, Washington Post, upper fold. Rural America's dying hospitals. Um, what does that mean? Well, this clearly shows what we're talking about. From 2010 to last year. Just look at this trend. At this current rate, a quarter, a quarter of the nation's hospitals are going to be closed within the next 10 years. What does that mean for health care? What does it mean that at a time when Tom is the director of the Federal Office of Rural Health and I am the CEO of the National Rural Health Association, we are seeing people die 20 years early and we're closing a quarter of our nation's hospitals? How does that fit into our matrix of check, meeting the needs? But that is where we're at right now. How do we address this? going ahead. Now I will say this, um, from 2001 to 2010, no one, not NRHA, not the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, not the American Hospital Association was tracking hospital closures. 
We weren't tracking it. Why? Because that wasn't happening. We'd have a couple close in one year, another one would open up, a couple would close. This is a recent phenomenon where we're seeing the fundamental approach to healthcare in rural America dramatically change. What we're seeing is two Americas emerge. Two Americas emerge. And that is not the direction that we want to be headed as a nation. All right, so let me, let me pull you through some maps because I think this helps illustrate this. First of all, when we talk about what is rural America, I like our map. To me, that's a good representation of where rural is. Keep the shape of those dots in mind as I drag you through some maps and tell me if you start seeing a pattern emerge. First of all, let's look at where the uninsured is today. Do you see any similarities approaching? Well, you should because um, in rural America, rural residents tend to be of lower income. Lower income, as a result of that, showing this poverty map, oftentimes, most times, means that you are uninsured. The uninsured population, you've got a rural population, which is uninsured, which is of lower income. If you start pulling out map after map after map of health disparities, you see a common pattern of this. Let's look at the obesity one, which directly matches our membership map. And with obesity, you have hypertension, you have um, all the other associated disparities that come with it, too. You see two Americas emerging. And so you get the point where from a population, the rural population starts feeling like they are being ignored, they are being left behind, and the next thing you know, we have a national presidential election. <laughs> How the population in rural America views what the nation is doing from directly derives to what we're having. Okay, stop, 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 all right? This is the problem with every rural policy discussion. We spend slides after slides after slides telling how everything is going to hell in a handbasket, and then we want to have young students go into rural America. <laughs> Come to rural America. You'll be paid less. People will die. It's a great place to work. From a marketing standpoint, this is terrible, people. We are doing this the wrong way. We have to remember to also highlight all the amazing things that are good about rural America. The ability from a student perspective to be a leader, to be able to innovate, um, all the things that go with this. From an educational standpoint, we're doing it wrong also. Um, from a health standpoint, we are taking upper income urban kids who <coughs> score high on their MCATs, we are training them in urban facilities, and then we're placing them in Flush, Kansas and wondering why the heck they won't stay out there. Of course they're not. We need to, the data shows, get people from rural communities. Make sure that we share with them the ability to stay with their family, to stay with their community, to live. That healthcare is a reasonable and an amazing career to go into. We need to do a better job with that. And I think, I believe, I'm sure, that this fellowship internship that Dr. Brand is establishing is an amazing legacy to head finally on the right track to where we need to be going with that. That is how we should be addressing this. All right, so many times when I talk about rural America, the answer is, eh, what are you going to do? Eh, people are dying. What are you going to do? Well, let's look at the national trends for, for rural. The rural population over the last three years, according to the Census Department, has stabilized. And even for counties that are adjacent to urban areas, there's been a dramatic increase in rural populations. People now are choosing the rural way of life to live. Thanks largely to the, the access to internet, to be able to work wherever you want, it's starting to create a future for rural America. Now I know what you're saying, okay, well this is a bunch of baby boomers um, wistfully remembering what it was like to live in rural America, and they're moving back. Well that wouldn't account for the fact that the um, children and the youth population is actually increasing in rural America. This is not just baby boomers, we are seeing a resurgence of rural America as a possible lifestyle going ahead. 
Um, we're seeing a diversification of rural America. Rural America, as you follow the popular media, is comprised only of white races. That's what you hear about on the news all the time, is it not? But what we're seeing in the actual data is the diversification, the reemergence of rural. And when we're talking about health, which we are, let's talk about what the data shows. And according to data from the federal government, the quality of care that you see in rural America is as good, or in many cases better, than your urban counterparts when it comes to basic primary care. So rural is an option. Rural is a future that we need to make sure that we are promoting as we go ahead. This is an amazing period of our uh, nation's country right now where we can actually hopefully move the policy in the right direction. And as we go ahead, we need to make sure, as Tom indicated, that we have rural relevant solutions. This is what this internship is about. Whether you go with FORHP or NRHA, actually taking part in redesigning our health system for rural America. As we go ahead, this has to be a nonpartisan approach, right? We have to divide this out. We cannot allow rural America to be perceived as only appealing to one political party. And the reason for that is because of the major be debate being talked about right now, the Affordable Care Act. Now, I'm not going to get down to the weeds of this, but I think this highlights the challenge and the problem that we have from a rural health context. And at NRHA, we are down in the weeds with this right now. This chart shows the nation's farmers and ranchers from 2015. Because of the Affordable Care Act, now nearly 90% of the nation's farmers and ranchers have coverage for health insurance, which they did not have before. That is fantastic. That is the positive and the good aspect of the Affordable Care Act, which we need to maintain. However, from purely a rural context of these 90% of the nation's farmers and ranchers, 70% in the same survey said that their insurance was too high, approaching the point of being unaffordable, and that 70% also said, my insurance is not adequate. That is not a success story. The fact that they're covered is a success story. So going ahead, how do we in a nonpartisan uh, manner indicate we need to maintain this coverage while at the same time making it work for rural populations? And that's the real challenge of this. How do we make a solution that works for rural as we move forward? Now, I want to keep everyone on time, so I'm going to move ahead to some what I think is really innovative approaches towards healthcare in the future. So bear with me, this is not one of those innovative approaches. Um, so much of the discussion is how we redesign the healthcare system right now, and how do we make this work in a rural context. So let me tell you the exciting stuff of what we're talking about now. We're talking about redesigning the basic concept of a rural hospital as we move ahead. In the 1940s, the federal government created this uh, program, the Hill Burton program, which allowed the construction of these large inpatient facilities across America. As we know, that model just simply doesn't work in low population areas anymore. So we need to be innovative about this, and we need to look at creating new hospitals of the future that allow that 24-7 emergency room service, but you don't have to have inpatient beds. You can just have outpatient care. One that is highly utilizing telehealth. Telehealth is a tool, it's not the solution, but by utilizing telehealth to bring um, specialists and peer-to-peer -peer learning and that consultation together, we have a model going ahead as we move. So for students, that really is what we're talking about. How, how do we redesign the system that is rural appropriate by utilizing technology um, and creating an entirely new healthcare delivery option? Now, Tom mentioned global budgeting. Okay, let me try not to get really in the weeds, but this concept really is not that complicated and it's pretty innovative and interesting, you think, what this may mean for all of us going ahead. 
Let's take a small rural community you live in right now, or if you're in a large city too, fine, that even works for you. You go see your clinician, they send you to the specialist, they take the test, you build a whole bunch of money, you may or may not know what's wrong with you. <laughs> so what if we change this entirely? And we take a small community in West Virginia, and you talk to the hospital, you talk to the long-term care, you talk to the EMS, how much did you spend the last year in Medicare and Medicaid services? It was X amount, fine, we'll give you X amount plus a 2% increase, good luck with it. Now, let's partner up and let's figure out, knowing that we've got that money, how do we use community health workers? How do we use dental uh, therapists? How do we use telehealth, which we were getting paid for in the past, but now we know we can provide the right service at the right time? You can see how you make this shift towards keeping us healthy instead of treating us and trying to bill us for services. This is a dramatic change to how we see healthcare. This is the Jetsons we were promised. That reality is so close right now, and as Tom indicated, it's going to be tested in rural communities in Pennsylvania coming up next year. What could this mean for West Virginia? Just think about that. Think about the opioid crisis. What I hope that I'm trying to convey here is this is one of the most exciting times in our nation's history for healthcare and what can be. Um, a lot of what we were promised now has the option to see it. But let me leave you with this. Change is more likely to occur in small organizations. Much of the innovation we've seen over the last 20 years has happened in rural communities, not large medical institutions that have to approve things through the boards and the regions and the blah, 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 blah. In a rural context, you can see what works. You can amend it. You can change it. The innovation that we see in our nation's country are happening in rural America right now. So this opportunity to be on the front line of redesign is such an amazing blessing. Thank you, Dr. Van, for the opportunity to extend this to students. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brand, and thanks to everyone who's here on a beautiful day. Um, I will be a, a brief, and I'm not as caffeinated as Alan is, so I apologize, <laughs> uh, but I do still have energy. So just to give you a quick snapshot as to why I'm here, and also a throwback photo of Dr. Brand um, from about 15 years ago. Uh, as she mentioned, I was an intern um, at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, um, so I feel very fortunate. I can actually attest to what it's like to work for Alan, Tom, and Dr. Brand. Um, so I, I, I feel like I'm in this exclusive club of one, uh, but very blessed to have done so. Uh, but I did start off at the federal office, had a chance to work on some uh, leadership programming there at the office, but also had an opportunity to travel to rural America. Uh, I'm originally from Texas. I had never been to Washington, D.C., so my sister helped me move out to the East Coast, a little bit of Thelma and Louise driving along the way. Um, and what was only going to be 10 weeks has turned into 15 years. Um, so I spent my time at the federal office uh, learning from the great Dr. Brand and Tom Morris, and then uh, was uh, had an opportunity to go work at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, where I handled uh, rural health legislative issues for Medicare Part A. And then um, I had met Alan actually 15 years ago as well while I was at the federal office and he said, you know, someday we're going to work together. And I said, sure, sure. And well, he won. Um, so uh, this is just some snapshots of our trip to Montana where we had an opportunity with the National Advisory Committee for Rural Health and Human Services to visit um, some of the clinics out in Billings, I believe it was, um, and also had a meeting with um, the advisory group there and also just another life for me experience to get to see what people are really doing um, on the ground in rural health care. So you've already seen this and it's in your program just who we are at the National Rural Health Association and we do have a, a membership that spans over 21,000 around the country. A lot of our focus is on advocacy and policy development so working on legislative issues we do a lot of action alerts um, at our shop in DC as well as uh, working on congressional testimony, appropriations tracking, um, looking at comments and, and preparing them on regulations, as well as policy briefs and papers that are pertinent to various rural health issues. 
We also have a lot of um, communication avenues that we work to help send out our messaging. Um, so some of our internships, a lot, our interns along the way have had the opportunity to work on some of these different aspects um, to help contribute to some of these. But we have a quarterly publication. We also work with the or have the journal, journal of rural health, which some of the students in the room may have utilized, hopefully at one point or another during their studies, or you should. Um, as well as access to policy experts, organization linkages. We have our NRHA Connect, which is our equivalent of Facebook for the membership internally as well. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We also host nine conferences a year, that is correct, nine conferences a year to really accommodate the broad spectrum of rural health care membership that we cover. Um, and so as a result, some of the interns have had an opportunity to travel with us to some of these meetings, but there literally is something for everyone. We're actually gearing up to host four conferences at once in one week in San Diego. You heard that correctly. <laughs> so we really appreciate the internship, the interns that are able to come in early on in the year to help us coordinate some of that because we aren't able to clone staff, um, but we do handle those four meetings at once. Um, again, and it's based on the needs and the interests of the membership, and given the critical time that it is for healthcare in America, especially for rural healthcare, um, we're looking at a, a big audience there coming up. And so, focus on different areas. Obviously, you see the list here, working with state rural health associations as well, quality and clinical issues, critical access hospitals, rural health clinics, and our policy institute, which is also sort of our uh, pep rally of the year that we start off with in February in DC. There's a lot of networking opportunities, again, just having access to all this information sharing, best practices, innovation, research, and just building contacts as well within the membership. We do have a board of trustees that thankfully Alan deals with um, constantly. And we also have a uh, Rural Health Congress, which is sort of like the Congress uh, on Capitol Hill, but less messy our internal Congress, but they officially pass um, the policy for our association. We also have a government affairs committee that sets the tone for legislation, and we're divided by <coughs> constituency groups based on interest. And here's sort of a brief snapshot of all the different groups and councils that we have, again, based on um, the membership that we have and the various interests around the country. And you'll notice here in red that we do have a student constituency group, and this just became about a couple of years ago because of the large number of students um, that had an interest. So this means that each of the chairs of all of these constituency groups has a seat on our board of trustees. So we do have a student that is our board member who also takes a look at when we get raises and things like that as well. But uh, our membership fee is $15, so for the students in the room, I highly encourage you to ride that student wave uh, for membership rates as long as you can, especially right now, um, and take advantage of the opportunities, the networking piece, especially within our association, um, as well as access to the journal and so forth that you would have as a member. So some of the opportunities when you are a member of NRHA as a student, again, obviously being able to uh, complete a practicum or internship with us. We also offer scholarships, so travel allowances, for you to attend some of our nine conferences uh, that we host a year, depending on where your interests are. We also have a Rural Health Fellows Program, which is designed to help generate the next generation of leaders for rural health care. Um, and that's sort of a, a year-long program in addition to whatever else you do in your studies. Um, but it's a chance to work on policy at a national level as well, and then also interact with some of our leadership at the association. There's also an opportunity to submit posters and research presentations at our various conference, which actually looks good on your resume. Um, but again, also an opportunity to showcase what it is you've been working on uh, in your respective studies. We have a special student's track, track within our annual conference every year. Um, and this is a uh, student design. So our student board member, along with some of the other students in the cohort, kind of design the agenda for the meeting and have a, a host of leaders talk to students during that time as well. And we also really focus on leadership development, especially when it comes to driving policy. So there's an opportunity to participate on our grassroots call that we have monthly, sometimes more frequently, depending on what's happening in Capitol Hill. Obviously, there's a lot going on right now in Washington, DC. So um, our government affairs staff leads those calls, and it's an opportunity for students especially to get engaged, kind of hear what's happening uh, in DC and how that's impacting where you want to go in your future as well. So the internship experience. We actually ran a little quick data survey uh, before coming here, 
and realize that in just four years, we've had over 20 interns um, work with us from around the country representing 16 different schools. And this is both at the undergraduate and graduate level, and they come from all studies, so public health, we've had a lot of nurses come through um, as well, some MD uh, candidates, health administration backgrounds, political science, sociology, uh, we've had international affairs as well. So the whole gamut, um, as you might have figured based on the presentations that Alan and Tom just gave, you know, it's all related, um, it's all connected, and so whatever you might be studying, you know, somewhere along the way you might notice you know, where there is um, uh, paths being crossed when it comes to rural health care. And some of the projects that folks have had a chance to work on, again, this is varied. We cover the broad spectrum of rural health, so folks have had a chance to work on HIV AIDS, obviously the opioid crisis right now, so we've had some folks address that through policy briefs. Also, uh, our oral health initiative, folks have had a chance to work on that. Um, and also just looking at survey analysis. We were just talking about SPSS earlier and uh, collecting some data. Uh, we have had some biostatistic majors come through the office as well. Um, looking at just meeting coordination. Obviously, we host a lot of meetings. Um, and helping to nominate uh, officials for important positions at the national level. We had a student help us uh, nominate someone for US Surgeon General a few years ago. So just a lot of opportunities to be part of some of these national efforts. So these are some of our general requirements. Obviously, through your program here, you'll have sort of a different um, requirement level, but we do look at CVs, resumes, as well as your requested time frame. And if you want more information, we do have a link. You can just Google Rural Health as well, get to our website, but we do have a little bit more in-depth information on our internship program as well on there. And just some of the expectations. What would you do? What is the opportunity? So, um, you know, obviously I'm speaking from the NRHA vantage point, but I can assure you that if you come to NRHA, you're still going to get to work with Tom Morris. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. We, we do have a collaboration with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy through our grant programming, but also he's at a lot of our meetings speaking as well. Um, and then vice versa, if you're at the Federal Office, you'll also be exposed to a lot of NRHA as well in that capacity. So you do get the best of both worlds no matter which side that you um, end up going on. Uh, additionally, we, again, coordinate various program meetings and content work with our interns on that. The policy briefs, another great opportunity to really understand how to navigate policy at a national level, um, but also how to bring that back to the local level, if, you know, when you do come back to the community as well. So very uh, good, important skill set to attain there. Uh, looking at evaluating some of our programs for their effectiveness, as well as uh, looking at the nonprofit management side of things, learning how you have to take some things and just run with it in nonprofit world, whereas federal government, that's a little bit different. You might have a little more restriction, um, but still a great opportunity to see both sides of, of that coin there. And then also just obviously becoming well versed on rural health issues in general, looking at the grant writing process as well as the legislative process. And again, um, with our government affairs team being uh, situated in the DC office, there's an opportunity to go to Capitol Hill to attend a lot of uh, briefings. Um, our government affairs staff is constantly doing what we call Rural Health 101 briefings to educate new members of Congress in particular and their staff about rural health <laughs> issues and how uh, they vary from urban. Uh, and also looking at regulations, analysis of that, and tracking funding and appropriations, which is critical to a lot of our rural health programs. We also have 40 state rural health associations around the country. One of our strongest ones is in West Virginia. Um, and you have a, a very strong advocate in Devron who helps lead that here. And so if you're not a member of the state association, we strongly encourage you to do that as well. Um, they are a very powerful voice within our collective group of state rural health associations, and they meet annually uh, every summer. But we really rely on our state chapters to serve as our <coughs> grassroots um, affiliates to help rally the troops, so to speak. And we've been doing a lot of that lately, uh, based on all the news and headlines that Alan showed you earlier as well. So the advocacy piece. And then we also offer them technical assistance <coughs> grants um, every year through our collabor collaboration with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. So that's some other tracking that we do as well. And here's sort of a, a brief snapshot of the ones we have. Those states in red do not have one. However, we obviously still work with all of those states to cover rural health issues and make sure that we're advocating on the issues that they're facing in their state as well. 
We also have a rural community health worker training network, so this is an opportunity as well to uh, highlight and, and look at some of the um, opportunities for training community health workers or lay health members of the community to improve access to care. So we have a couple of grant opportunities um, that have allowed some of our interns to attend some of the trainings, which we have referred to as the really feel-good trainings. Um, they get to see firsthand how people are going out to the communities, getting those patients to get access to care and what that's meant for health outcomes. So it's been a very powerful experience um, for some of the interns that have had a chance to work on this as well. We also have a border health initiative. Obviously, as uh, Dr. Brand highlighted earlier and Tom and Alan, you know, there's various rural health issues happening around the country, the border obviously being one, um, as well as Appalachia, the Delta, so forth, but looking at sort of the different implications there along the border, so interns have had an opportunity to uh, work on this piece as well with us. We also have a rural oral health initi initiative through our collaboration with the DentaQuest Foundation, so focusing on these four tiers of policy, communication, education, and research. So we've had an intern this uh, semester who helps sort of look at best practices around the country related to rural oral health to help inform us of our strategy for helping to elevate oral health care as part of primary care. Also have a rural veterans issue, so looking at addressing some of those access to care issues for rural veterans, which has also been uh, a very interesting piece for interns to work on as well. We actually have an intern who's looking to uh, perhaps change her studies uh, to work more with veterans who was with us, I believe, last fall um, and is now looking to, to change and focus more on veterans as a result of her experience there. And rural philanthropy, a chance to sort of see who's investing in innovation related to rural oral health. So remember I said you get a chance to work with Tom Morris as well. This is one of those activities because this is part of our collaboration with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. So we do have some interns that have helped with this activity. We're bringing all these foundations that invest in rural health innovation together in June um, to talk about ways that they can continue to do so going forward. And again, our fellows program, I mentioned that earlier, looking at uh, developing the next generation of rural leaders. So there are a lot of folks that might be retiring, so really looking to pass the gauntlet to the next generation to help focus and continue the leadership, the fight to protect things and healthcare uh, for rural Americans as well. So what you walk away with, something that I don't know that uh, necessarily comes from attending classes every semester, but something you learn when you're forced out into the real world, so to speak, and where the internship really becomes critical, the networking aspect. That's not something you necessarily learn uh, in a classroom setting, but that you're forced to do, especially in Washington, D.C. It's a highly competitive area. As I learned when I arrived there, thinking, what have I done? Similar reaction that Tom had. Um, but you know, the only person that is able to market you at the end of the day is you. And so learning to get outside of, of your comfort zone and really representing who you are and what you're capable of is something that you definitely learn uh, through the internship and you're exposed to meeting a lot of different leaders within the area. Staying connected. Uh, we encourage our interns to actually conduct informational interviews. So go sit with Tom Morris, go sit with Alan Morgan, talk to them about their journey how did they get to where they are? Obviously, Dr. Brand, um, but a lot of different leaders in the area, members of Congress, you know, wherever your interests may lie, but to learn about their journey and sort of how they, you know, got in the pathway that they're on, uh, which has become a really valuable experience. And we, in turn, have remembered that because when we're going through our hiring process, we remember those interns who have made that effort or who have stayed connected with us as well. Um, to go that extra mile. Uh, and obviously staying involved in alumni once you're finished with your programming, but also paying it forward. DC is a big town, but it's also a small town at the end of the day, and people remember things, so always best not to burn bridges, but just paying it forward. You never know uh, who can be helpful or, or who you might need to help as well. So um, a lot of different skill sets to, to take away through this opportunity. But also it's fun because Alan will take you to go at, uh, in front of the White House and take a picture. And sometimes he'll let you hold the R. Um, and so it's a great opportunity in the long run. Uh, but lots of, of opportunities to just go to different meetings. We have had some interns attend meetings at the White House when the opportunities have been made available. Um, but also obviously Capitol Hill. So it's great exposure. 
Um, it is a whole other world. I can attest to that being from Texas is its own country, obviously, uh, compared to DC, but I, I don't regret a, a minute of having made that decision. Um, and I think if your heart is in helping rural areas, I'm from a very small town, my family's still there, so the issues impacting the border impact my family. Um, you know, it's, it's where you're meant to be, and at the end of the day, walking away with, you know, knowing you did something to make a difference is pretty powerful. So, thank you for your time. First of all, I'm the only thing standing between you and some cookies. So, <laughs> but first of all, uh, Dr. Brand, thank you so much for bringing bringing your friends and your team here uh, to to Shepherd University, and they are extraordinary. We thank you so much for sharing uh, not only your time, your expertise, your passion uh, for this issue, but also for bringing to us this partnership these innovative opportunities that can help the vulnerable populations in our area because these new solutions are really the way that we're going to be able to make a difference in the communities that we serve. And so Tom, Alan, and Amy, I think we just need to give you a round of applause. And thank you. I'm assuming you know, but anyway, I'm Scott Beard, Associate Provost and Dean of Graduate Studies here at Shepherd University. And so now we're at the point in the program, well now what happens? So um, we do have some information up on a web page. It's really easy to remember, shepherd.edu slash rural dash health. And we have some information about uh, today's meeting, uh, how to apply for the internships, and we might also make today's PowerPoints available uh, online if you guys would be so amenable to that. Uh, and, and contact information. And so this is just uh, an amazing opportunity. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Sharon Maley, who is the director of our nursing program uh, here at Shepherd University, and Dr. Ben Mars, who is our incoming, our new dean of our newly uh, official as of yesterday, uh, College of <laughs> Business. So we're very excited about that. And just to let you know that here at Shepherd, our MBA program, we have a concentration in health administration. Uh, in our nursing program, it's one of our largest undergraduate majors and also houses our very first uh, doctoral program here at Shepherd, our Doctor of Nursing Practice. So Dr. Mayer and Dr. Mills. And let me know if you need me to click. If we do clicky, he's going to do the clicky, but I, it was most informative, and thank you for coming to share such an important issue with us. Um, we have video take this, so we will be used in all of our classes, so you will be part of our history. <laughs> but, I, but I have learned a couple things. I, I didn't know about this. Uh, <laughs> 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 Do I have it right? Yeah. I know, but uh, I'm down here in the Putnam County, uh, so I too am from West Virginia. And I love the idea that we have a tourist birthday here. I uh, understand we have two, and let me say I'm three. So we'll have to have a birthday party together, that's for sure. Uh, but before we talk about this, I do want to say we're honored and thrilled uh, to have Dr. Brand uh, award two rural health internships annually with such prestigious organizations. Uh, the opportunity for our students and faculty will strategically position us to address some of the toughest health care challenges in the nation. And they're located right here in West Virginia. And uh, Tom, I think you spoke so well to that also. Uh, the state is experiencing one of the worst health pandemics in history. And addressing the issues with rural health and what we can do with our students and in particular with our DMP students and our with the family nurse practitioners, uh, hopefully through these internships uh, we can make a difference. 
these internships will better prepare us with advocacy tools. I think you alluded to those quite eloquently. And insight into the complexity of improving rural health for our community. Because that's what we're all about. That's why we come to work every day to make a difference in our community. And I'm going to let the boss talk now. No. That's over to you. The, uh, uh, I'll just talk about some of the nuts and bolts. Uh, did you, yeah, there's the application. Some of the nuts and bolts. If you're a student, um, there's an application out on the website. Um, if you are somebody who uh, knows of a student or is a uh, teacher of a student, uh, the application is out on the website. It's pretty simple as, it's, as it stands right now with a statement of intent and um, some demographic information. Uh, as the process goes, um, <coughs> promote, evaluate, execute. So what you're gonna see um, over time as we implement this, you'll see the promotion, will be website promotions, uh, university, the nursing and business websites, uh, spring flyers for classes, uh, actually uh, visits to classes and we may be some people to come back for visits. Um, spring announcement and workshop, we want to do it early enough in case there's a security clearance issue um, to get uh, our students there. And after the second year, we're hoping to have student participation from the ones that came before. So if you get an internship, there may be an obligation to come back and kind of uh, tell the students about, future students about that, uh, your experience. Um, the evaluation, uh, accept and collate the applications. There will be a committee review. Um, and the criteria that's going to be used to, for evaluation, um, uh, we really want to emphasize that the, uh, the statement of intent matches well with the rural health objective, the objective of the internships. Um, so the quality of the application, the essay itself, uh, how it relates to rural health, how it relates to your career, uh, future goals, uh, the quality of reference letters, uh, and clarity and feasibility of the application. Into the execution, we're looking, uh, we're targeting 180 hours of internship. We will be, there is an establishment of uh, academic guidelines to the student's course credit. So if a student wants to take uh, have the internship and at the same time have course credit, they'll be able to do that. Uh, it has, uh, it will have to have an approved academic component to it, but we've talked about some of the things that they can do uh, for academic credit. Um, their evaluation with their, uh, with their internship sponsor, uh, final paper and project, and then us, we have to turn around and review of the process and adjust it as necessary to make it better the next year. So that's kind of where we're heading. If you're a student and interested, opportunities are this summer. Um, if you're a student and are interested in the uh, in next summer, there will be opportunities there also. The other is to uh, in the audience. If you're if you're a, a teacher or faculty member and you come across students, make sure that you are. Uh, promoting this for for next spring. Any questions, concerns, comments, jokes? <laughs> well, I think that's that's it. We want to thank you so much for coming today to oh, find out about this uh, new opportunity. Or there's a question. What is the deadline for this summer to apply? How fast do you want to work? Yeah. Yes. How fast? Uh, apply. How's that? Yes. We will, um, um, the, the, the application is out there. Um, if you have students that you're, you want to uh, have them apply, have them apply. We will expedite the committee and we will ex expedite the acceptance. Okay. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. And again, it's shepherd.edu slash rural dash health. So thank you again. Uh, please grab something to drink, cake, cookies. Uh, we have some containers. So <laughs> we thank you very much and have a great weekend.